Welcome back to The Theology of the Buddy, a podcast for Catholics who love the beauty of the church's sacred tradition. This is episode 77. My name is Chris, and I'm joined today by my enlightened co-hosts, Mike, Brooke, and Tim. Before we begin, if you haven't yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you are listening and leave us a five-star review. It really helps us out. Don't forget to drop by TheologyOfTheBuddy.com for all of our show notes and past episodes. While you're at it, don't forget to follow us on social media so you can, you can keep up to date with all of the great content we are sending out. You can find us at Theology of the Buddy, uh, And now, with new and improved Twitter presence, you can find us at Stay Traddy, all one word. All right, so on today's podcast, we're going to be getting into two really cool topics. We're going to be talking about the great feast of Candlemas, also known as the purification of the of the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, in the traditional rite, or known as the presentation uh, in the new calendar. And we're going to talk about Catholic home defense, ways that you and your family can defend your home against the incursion of evil. So you're going to want to stay tuned uh, to, and hear about that as we get into it. But before we do, how are my enlightened co-hosts doing today? Very bright, at least brighter than usual. Oh, that's a low bar, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe a little. It's a good day. Glad to be here. Good to see you guys again. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, Tim. Likewise. I'm just really hungry. (laughs) 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 Somebody needs to give that girl some carbs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. She doesn't get enough of those. So Um, before we before we get into our uh, little intro discussion, uh, before we get into Candlemas, I want to quickly dedicate this episode. We're recording tonight uh, on the 22nd of January in the year of our Lord, 2022. Um, and right now in Canada, there is a convoy of truckers that are traveling from all across Canada to our nation's capital in Ottawa uh, to... Uh, protest against the vaccine mandates, especially the vaccine mandates that have come against truckers uh, who uh, have been bringing goods into Canada and out of Canada throughout the course of the whole pandemic um, and putting food on our shelves and um, yeah, delivering our most essential goods. Uh, we're now seeing in Canada, I don't know about in the United States, but we're seeing in Canada bare shelves uh, in our grocery stores and, and in other places, and things are getting worse. And so, uh, yeah, so tonight I am drinking Nanaimo Bar uh, liqueur, uh, which is, I guess Nanaimo Bars uh, are a Canadian thing, um, but Nanaimo, mm-hmm. BC, British Columbia, uh, I guess is technically where it might be from. I'm not 100% sure on that. Don't quote me. But I'm drinking to them tonight, and uh, I would like to invite my uh, enlightened co-hosts to uh, raise a glass to our g- great truckers of Canada. So God bless them. Cheers. We're praying for you guys. Cheers. All that stuff is so good. Yeah. Congratulations to uh, Trudeau on the dumbest rule yet. Got to mandate people who sit alone all day. That's definitely worth destroying the whole country's economy over. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Well, now that we've got that kind of <laughs> downer news out of the way, uh, <laughs> let's let's get into uh, the icebreaker. This was something that Tim had suggested. So I'm going to throw it to Tim. Tim, take it away. Okay. So, Mike, I think this might be a good one to ask you, but I'm going to open it up to everybody as well. What is the craziest thing that you have ever prayed for? And what is the craziest thing that you pray for on a regular basis? Uh, definitely Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's for both questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the best thing you ever got, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can, I can derail a question just oh like that. 
<laughs> it was so fast. <laughs> uh, okay. Mm, craziest thing I pray for on a regular basis. I'm trying to think of the things that I pray for every day, and they're not that crazy. Well, pretty normal stuff like my family and the church. Um, Eddie's weird wonky eyes. I pray for that. Yeah. Every, that every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for healing for her, for all the all the babies at the church, including Chris's baby. Um. Yeah, there's nothing that weird. Nothing that weird. Nothing on that's there. Like, if if anybody knew that I was praying for the sick, probably question my sanity just a little bit. Let's hear it. Okay, so for me, the craziest thing that I've prayed for when I was in first grade, I prayed for rocket shoes because I wanted to be able to fly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which I, I mean, it I seems it. I'm I'm sure it's like a normal kid thing, but. You know, yeah. So first grade, prayed for rocket shoes, but on a regular basis, and it's not every day, but probably at least once a week, I'm just like, God, you could take semiconductors from us, and I think we'd be a lot better off. Semiconductors. <laughs> semiconductors, yeah. Just yank that one I, I bit just... of technology out, and I think that, yeah, <laughs> knock us back to the steam level. <laughs> That's, that's a good point. <laughs> Definitely need a new job. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to podcast. So what you're anymore. saying is you, you can yeah, be a different kind of engineer. Basis, you pray for uh, God to take away the podcast. That makes sense. <laughs> you know, we could release on Victorola. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, send out yeah. copies on vinyl. <laughs> you, you know what we oh could goodness. do? We can start a. We can start our like own publication, like Maximilian Colby did, and it'll just be an. Oh um, yeah, it'll be an. Uh, what do you call it? A uh, documentary podcast. Yeah, <laughs> mm, makes sense. Yeah, Brooke. Yo, know, mine's so depressing. Okay, <laughs> go on. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a crazy thing to pray for, as in yeah. you had a mental illness. Yes. <laughs> Brooke, we started with Justin Trudeau. I think he's going to be okay. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's true. Okay. So back in the days of my emo ness and undiagnosed mental problems, I think we shared this on an early episode of the podcast in season one, maybe season two, Some, sometime. Anyway. Yeah, so I basically prayed that God would basically kill me so I wouldn't have to do it myself. Mm. <laughs> it got dark real quick. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so there was that. And on a daily basis, um, let's see, what do I pray for? Uh, nothing, nothing crazy. It's mostly just praying for the conversion of of like family and friends that have kind of, you have no idea how that, how their story would change. Right. You know, I'm often thinking of this, like, um, uh, Lindsay from uh, modern lady podcast and her story. Right. And kind of where she ca came from. I'm like, Oh, I'd love to see that happen with my family <laughs> and how like, it's crazy only in, in trying to picture how that change would manifest. So it's not, yeah, it's not crazy, like wild. It's like kind of hard to imagine. Yeah. Okay. Here's an actual story about praying for something weird that I can give you other than Brooke. And Chris can probably attest to this because he was a witness to this event. But um, back in the life team days, oh, this story is going to get wild. Okay. Back in the life team days in our church basement, we had a concert and yeah. there was a point where there were some technical malfunctions and uh, we decided to all pray on mass for the uh, miraculous repair of an electric guitar. <laughs> 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 and uh, despite the sketchy circumstances, this prayer was granted. <laughs> um, the strings were healed. And I, this was such a such a funny moment 
but like <laughs> we're all so hyped up and we're so like I don't know, young and dumb and life teen. But I legitimately <laughs> thought of this for a while as like a uh, an important event. <laughs> like, <laughs> prayer, prayers were answered. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> oh. Teenagers, man. Man. Uh. Man. <laughs> uh. I had never heard that story before, but it's yeah, so good. I, I hadn't heard that story in a long time. I'd forgotten about it. Okay. That's really good. Oh boy. Um what's the craziest thing you've ever prayed for? I don't I don't really know if I have really a crazy thing that I've prayed for. I mean, I'm sure there is. But like there's been audacious things that I've prayed for, you know? Things like a swift end to the pontificate of Pro Francis, um, which would be wild. Okay. Um, but I think the one, the one big one that really sticks out to me is uh, like, so if anybody kind of knows where I live in hashtag St. Thomas, Ontario, St. Thomas is a bit of a hole. It's always been a hole. Um, and there's really never been anything good to come out of St. Thomas, just kind of, kind of like Nazareth and like, especially in terms of Catholicism, like it's always just been a hole here. Like I've always felt like I was one of the very few, if not the only young Catholic in the entire city. Um, and so me discovering the traditional Latin mass, I began to be inspired by St. Teresa uh, to pray that it would come to St. Thomas because she said, you know, you honor God greatly by asking big things of him. So I was like, okay, well, let's ask a really big thing that will never happen ever, ever, ever. Uh, Cause the closest Latin mass was like an hour and a half away. And so I was like, okay, whatever. And I just started praying for it. Um, and then I think within, within a year, uh, the Latin mass, and I felt really bad cause I kind of took it to heart a little bit. The Latin mass that had existed an hour and a half away essentially got, um, canceled and moved, but it moved literally like 15 minutes from my house to a different city, but still like, you know, really close. And I was like, Whoa, Lord, thank you. You listened. No way. Like, this is amazing. And then another year passed and like I had stopped praying, right? I had stopped asking the Lord to bring it to my hometown. And a year later, it literally arrived in my hometown five minutes from my house. So, yeah. So that was kind of like the craziest prayer and answer. Uh, Because, yeah, I never thought in my wildest dreams that it would ever be in St. Thomas at Holy Angels where I received all of my sacraments pretty much except for marriage and all of that. So yeah. Um, yeah. What is the craziest thing you pray for on a regular basis? I have no idea. I pray for a lot of things. I don't know if they're crazy or not, but yeah. Rocket shoes seem really important. So <laughs> Yeah, when you're I, might, I might start. Rocket shoes would be everything, <laughs> man. <laughs> like the um, like Back to the Future shoes, those would be sick, too. Yeah, yeah. I think first grade was kind of a weird time for me. <laughs> I, okay, so for everyone for everyone. <laughs> I haven't figured out because, like, I remember my teacher's name as being Mrs. Mouse, Mrs. Mouse. and I don't know if it. Yeah, I, and I haven't been able to figure out if that was actually her name. Or if that's just what I thought her name was and nobody corrected me. (laughs) My parents don't remember her. You know, my grandparents don't. Nobody remembers this woman. And like, I remember her clearly. And I remember her name being Mrs. Mouse. But yeah, so yeah. First grade was a very special time for me. (laughs) (laughs) When I started school, I thought I met a girl named Eggnog. Eggnog. What was her name? I don't remember. <laughs> I just Man. remember her as eggnog. Francine. Maybe it was eggnog. <laughs> Weirder things have happened. Could be eggnog. <laughs> Could be eggnog. I think I, I think I asked her name later, and then 
I said, oh, I thought your name was Eggnog. And she was probably like, that was, that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> was it that name? Oh, maybe Edna? I don't know. Oh, no. That's why you don't remember her, because she never talked to you again after you <laughs> yeah. said her name was Eggnog. <laughs> I'm just going to freeze this Brooke girl out. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, you guys want to talk about Candlemas? Yes. They are making their first North American tour since COVID hit. (laughs) They're coming to Houston. The epic doom rock band Candlemas is coming. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, When you shared that, I was like... Like the the one thing that I thought was funny was they misspelled candle mass by they put two yeah, S's. With two in it. S's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so weird. Yeah. Yeah. And t- Tim, you're supposed to be the normal one who doesn't talk about metal on the podcast. Yeah. The rest you know, of us are just scandalizing everyone. You guys are you guys have that metal background. My background is actually more punk. So, you know. <laughs> I'm well, just got, learning have, stuff on both a, sides of this. I have a punk background. You have a punk background? Yeah. We're going to we're gonna have to talk about this later. Yeah. Yeah. No. Mm. That's okay. What, that's what, that was the gateway yeah. drug to metal. He's, <laughs> he's using his punk voice now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, boy. Um, okay. Anyway. Uh, Candlemas. Candlemas. Yeah. Not so, the doom rock band, but. Uh, not the doom rock band. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the Feast of the Purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, also known as the Feast of, Pan- of Candlemas. This comes from the Angelus Press Missal. Uh, it says here, uh, the Feast of Candlemas, which derives its origin from the local observance of Jerusalem, marks the end of the feasts included in the Christmas cycle of the liturgy. It is perhaps the most ancient festival of Our Lady. It commemorates not only the obedience of the Blessed Virgin to the Mosaic Law in going to Jerusalem 40 days after the birth of her child and making the accustomed offerings, but also the presentation of our Lord in the temple and the meeting of the infant Jesus with the old man Simeon, the Ocursus Domini, as the feast was anciently termed. This is the principal theme of the liturgy on this day. Jesus is taken to the temple to present him to the Lord. So the Lord comes to his temple and is met by the aged Simeon with joy and recognition. The procession on this day is one of the most picturesque features of the Western liturgy. The blessing and distribution of candles to be carried lighted in procession precedes the Mass today, a symbolic presentation of the truth proclaimed in the Canticle of Simeon. Our Lord is the, quote, light for the revelation to the Gentiles, end quote. The anthems sung during the procession, Eastern in origin, will express the joy and gladness of this happy festival, and the honor and praise we give to our Blessed Lady and her Divine Son by its devout observance. So, Tim, have you been to a Candlemas Mass before? I have not. The only uh, Candlemas Masses that I've, well, I guess it's not really Candlemas in the Novus Ordo, but uh, at our local parish, they do the blessing of the candles. Oh, do they? But yes, yes. Uh, there's. It, it's actually one of the more impressive blessings that uh, I've seen in the Novus Ordo. But uh, I've not been to a Latin mass for Candlemas yet. Cool. Cool. Well, um, I was reading again in the Feast of Christendom. You can find it uh, on Amazon from uh, it's written by Philip Campbell. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll put a link in the show notes. So you can find it at theologyofthebuddy.com. Um, it says here for the Feast of Camb- Candlemas um, that. Candlemas was first referenced in the diary of the pilgrim Agaria from the first half of the 4th century. She tells us that it was then celebrated on February 14th with a solemn procession to the Basilica of the Resurrection, where a homily was delivered on Luke 2, verse 22. At the time, the feast had no formal name. However, it was simply known as the 40th day after Christ's birth. Incidentally, given that 40 days before February 14th is not December 25th, but January 5th, this confirms that in Jerusalem, the Vigil of Epiphany was observed as the time of Christ's birth in the early 4th century. End quote. Um, 
So it says here, the feast spread from Jerusalem to the Church Universal. Its date shifted to February 2nd, sometime around the end of the 4th century, 40 days after the Vigil of Christmas, which by the year 400 had been fixed on December 25th, at least in the Church of Rome. So that lines up with the date that a lot, a lot of Eastern Catholics use, right, for Christmas. Exactly. Yeah. We're kind of following along that because we have uh, that Ukrainian Catholic parish that we go to sometimes. And uh, mm. yeah, it's always during Christmas there, uh, like oh, two weeks behind or so. Yeah. 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 It says here, um, the feast first appears in the West in the Galatian Sacramentary under the title Purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is unclear when the feast was introduced. Some attribute it to the pontificate of Pope Gregory the Great. Um, it, now, with regards to, we were talking about the Candlemas blessing, right? The blessing of the candles and the procession. Um, so the Candlemas procession in the West has an interesting history. As we mentioned above, the procession was part of the original celebration mentioned by Agaria in Jerusalem. The Galatians uh, sacramentary, however, does not mention any procession. The feast was amended during the pontificate of Sergius III, who added a procession, but the Gregorian sacramentary, reflecting the customs of the early Carolingian era, make no mention of any procession. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, it says here, but... From whence came the blessing of the candles, from which Candlemas derived its nickname. It is uncertain when exactly the blessing of candles was introduced to the feast. Some place their introduction in the 5th century. The procession with blessed, can with blessed candles was undoubtedly in place by the Anglo-Saxon period in England, circa 500 to 1066, as the nickname Candlemas comes from the Old English Candlemace. I'm not sure how to read Old English. Um, literally, the candle mass. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it says here the observance of Candlemas of the Candlemas procession is primarily associated with the extraordinary form. Uh, you don't see it in the Novus Ordo. The traditional liturgy mm -hmm. has the procession begin after the office of Terse for the day. The celebrant in stole and cope of purple stands at the epistle side of the altar and blesses the beeswax candles. Having sung or recited the five prescribed orations, he sprinkles, sprinkles and incenses the candles. Then he distributes them while the choir sings the nunc dimittis. Um, during the following procession, the faithful carry lighted candles in their hands as the choir ch chants the antiphon Adorna Talum's Tomb Sion, composed by St. John Damascene. So, if you can get to a Candlemas this year wow. in the uh, traditional rite, do it, because it's pretty sweet. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful, though. And, you know, I think this kind of, uh, we, we're going to kind of get into the topic of Catholic home defense, but this kind of get it, gets into one of the things that I think are really important to have in your home which is blessed candles. Um, I think every Catholic family needs to have blessed candles, especially blessed beeswax candles. Yeah. It was really interesting to learn about the, um, uh, like the purification process that Mary had to experience. So after birth of a son, she was considered unclean for seven days. And then you would go to the temple, you would make your offering at the temple. And then um, she would actually have to go home and she would be like away from society for an additional 33 days because it was her first child. So we have the 33 plus seven, 40 days. Um, let me see here. And uh, the other interesting thing was um, like, we call it the churching process, right? So when she's reintroduced back into society as per mosaic law, um, they call this churching. And that's another thing we've kind of lost in the, um, like the Novus Ordo. It's kind of a parallel. Yeah, although, a parallel, yeah. Although there's no notion of uncleanness in the new yeah. covenant. It's more of a thanksgiving and like blessing of the woman after mm -hmm. giving birth. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's definitely a parallel to Our Lady and her um, purification, yeah. even though she didn't need purification. At yeah, all. exactly. Right. She was, she was still, um, like obedient to the law that was there, um, also to avoid scandal, 
right? Um, yeah, it's kind of like how our Lord was baptized, but he didn't really need to be baptized. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. The um, something that Philip Campbell mentions, too, in the Feast of Christendom is that, um, you know, there's there's that clear difference between moral purity and ritual purity. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, he says essentially to us in the modern modern West, we kind of go, well, that just seems superfluous. Right. Like, why would you need to go through that? Um, if you know, and he, he attributes that to, uh, kind of the influence of Protestantism, uh, in, in the West. Um, but you know, to them, you know, to our lady, to our blessed Lord, like they, they saw it as being fitting, right. And most fitting to do it. Um, not that they needed to do it, not because they were unclean, but because it was fitting and just to do so. Yeah, so I've been looking at this, and I'm kind of looking at this with newer eyes. And one of the things I notice is that there's a bookending of the Christmas season. You know, we begin with a star, and we end with candles. And it's this idea mm-hmm. of light of light in the darkness. You know, it's the darkest time of year. And, you know, it's kind of, it's the theme of the light has shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And mm-hmm. so you've got, you know, some very dark situations you know israel is subjugated by rome you've got herod who's about to massacre these children and you've got you know the light coming into the world at this point and so we're bookending the season with the celebration we've got the trees we've got the lights we've got you know the star and then on the other end we've got the candles and the candles, we have the blessing, and the candles carry us through the through the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, it's probably more pious mythology, which is fine. You know, I, I, there's definitely room for pious mythology, but uh, with the Irish, you know, we talk about, you know, Saint Bridget quite a bit. You know, she's one of our favorite saints, and. You know, she's like the perfect homeschool saint. You know, she's got a great story. She's got crafts that go with her because she's got her own little cross that you can make out of <laughs> out of out of paper straws. And yeah, you know, it's fantastic nope. for, for homeschooling kids. <laughs> you can homebrew a lake of beer. Oh my goodness, yes, it's amazing. <laughs> and you know, so Saint Bridget's Day is on the first, and you know, it's old calendar, new calendar. You know, Saint Bridget's Day is on the first. And it's this bridge that is built between Christmas and St. Patrick's Day in a lot of ways. But one of the pious, um, one of the pious illusions that we make, one of the pious mythologies that we have is that, you know, she's pictured as the daughter of the innkeeper in the Christmas story. You know, it's, you know, obviously not historical fact, but uh, she's, and also a lot of times you'll see her wearing a count a crown of candles and the story is that you know she would lead the uh herod's men away from the christ child so yeah i think that there's an interesting tie between those two that is unfortunately not very well explored but still a fantastic saint it's very cool i like it yeah i think you you know yeah i never really thought about that in terms of the, yeah, that, that presence and that common theme of light all the way through, mm-hmm. like, like the darkest moment, even in the calendar, just, it's really dark right now, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that's, yeah, that's something I'm going to have to meditate on a lot. <laughs> maybe, this, yeah. maybe this is a stretch, but you know, the light, the light of a star while visible, it's, it's not tangible. But to have the light of a candle, like in close proximity where you can feel its warmth, right? Yeah, yeah we have the, we have a lot of uh, Hispanic families at my parish. And I was talking to them because, you know, I came in, I had two candles. And they had boxes of candles. Like, wow, you guys use a <laughs> lot of candles. <laughs> and they told me, it's like, you know, this is, this is something that we do almost on a daily basis. Is they're using these candles, you know essentially 
you know, kind of to bridge to our next topic as a form of home defense, you know, if something's going on, if there's, you know, stress in the house, if there's arguments, if there's, you know, financial difficulties, if there's anything that's causing something to be unsettled or out of balance in the house, you know, they're lighting these candles and, you know, along with them, you know, sending up their prayers and using them as a, you know, a way to, you know, set apart their house. You know, know, this is a place of peace. This is a place of harmony. This is, you know, our home in a world of darkness. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, what stinks though, just how expensive beeswax candles. Are. Oh, they're oh, crazy yeah. expensive. <laughs> but like if yeah. you can get beeswax candles, I mean, obviously if you can't still get your yeah. candles blessed on candle, right. you know, go to the dollar store and pick up, you know, dollar store candles. But you know, if you can get beeswax, that's ultimately the best, but yeah. So cool. So, do you, do you want to ha- kind of talk about Catholic home defense now? Yeah, let's do yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we talked last last week. Brooke kind of brought up how she used Epiphany water and and holy water in general um, with you know when she had encountered issues in the house or things like that. Um, Stress. So, <laughs> Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about it. So, I mean, really Mm -hmm. our homes are, are ground zero for spiritual warfare, right? And it starts obviously within ourselves, but it can, it can spread to the entire house and, um, and our families. So I thought maybe we can talk about some, some ways that we can kind of defend our homes and ourselves from the incursion of evil. Sure. I think, uh, Step number one is have your house blessed. Like that was one of the first things that we basically wanted to schedule as soon as we moved. I think we did it to our old, yeah. like at our old house too, but mm-hmm. I can't quite remember. Thanks Father Steve. Yeah. I know Father Steve blessed our house here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and using blessed salt too. Um, did we not have blessed salt and we put it around in corners of the rooms? That was another thing that we did. I don't know if we did that. Okay. I might be just dreaming something. I don't know. The house blessing is super important. But that is a good thing to do. I think we've talked about that before. Yeah. I, th- I thought so too. Um, Are we talking blessed salt or exercise salt? I I hope it's exercise salt. Yeah. I believe exercised, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. If, it, if yeah. it's done in the traditional yeah. right, then it would be exercise salt. Um. Yeah. Blessed images. I think, mm-hmm. you know, um, I think that's really important. It not only is a sacramental, right, and has sacramental properties and can defend against evil in itself, but it also helps to draw the mind and the heart to God throughout the day. You know, you look up at the crucifix and, you know, and and it reminds you of our Lord and you can meditate on his passion or you know, even for that brief moment, you know, and it's important for our kids to see that too. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so just a, just a random anecdote. So I I started a job this past week and I totally quit the job, but, um, I went into the job and went into, you know, start the, start the work. And there was actually a crucifix hanging on the wall. And like the day before I quit, I was just like, you know, praying about what to do. And I'm like, and I looked up at that crucifix in the, in the office. I'm like, okay, Lord, like <laughs> this is yours, you know, I need your help. Um, so yeah, I mean, even just in the midst of, of the day, having, having those images, even if you carry them on your person too, if you can carry mm-hmm. like an image of our Lord in your pocket, like, like medals or, you know, things like that, um, a rosary in your pocket, these kinds of things can help, uh, draw the mind and the heart to God. Family prayers, family prayer time. Like we've made it a priority in our house to consistently have a family rosary done every single day. Um, most of the time it's after lunch where we can do it all together, kids included, even though it's uh, sometimes like playing the, praying the rosary, you know, with a bunch of monkeys. Um, the quietest rosary times are always Sundays on the drive to mass because they can't escape. <laughs> they're strapped in their car seats and they can't leave, but they know to be quiet while we're praying the rosary. Um, Instilling that special time 
and them knowing that it's part of our family life in the house. Yeah. Super important. And then on the flip side, the, the private prayer of the parents too, right? Mm -hmm. Especially um, the head of the household, you got to be praying for the protection of your home and your family. I think um, that's something that I try and make sure to do every day is like just directly pray against that um, demonic influence and for the protection of the house, you know, pray the same Michael prayer dads. And, you know, if you, uh, if you can find a good, like uh, deliverance prayer or something like that, um, I'd say that's a good uh, routine thing for the head of the household to be doing. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, make a point of putting a crucifix in every room of our house. Mm. Like, like, like what Chris was saying, like no room is spared. We have one in the laundry room and in the garage. They're humble crucifixes, but crucifixes nonetheless. And uh, yeah, you basically can't go from one room into another without seeing one. Yeah. Hard, you know, coming back to that deliverance prayers thing. So the book Del- Deliverance Prayers for the Laity by Father Chad Ripperger is a fantastic, fantastic resource. Mm-hmm. Um, you can actually get a copy of it. There's a link in our show notes at theologyofthebuddy.com. Uh, go to the Tumblr House link. You can actually buy it directly from Tumblr House and help us out in the process. So uh, definitely go there and search Deliverance Prayers or look for Father Ripperger, R I P P E R G E R. And uh, yeah, you'll be sure you'll be sure to find it there. Okay. So the, the prayers are pretty much plug and play. You know, you can, you can get copies of the books pretty easily for people who don't have say a traditional parish or um, a traditional priest or a priest who's willing to exercise the salt or, you know, bless the candles or, you know, uh, exercise the water as well. You know, getting a hold of that seems like it would be somewhat of a challenge now you can't go out and just buy like, okay, I'm going to buy exercise salt. You know, that it seems like there's uh, certain barriers to entry on that, you know, like moral sin, but is there like, do you guys, is there a, a, like a proper way to go about getting it? Do you, because, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, because it's valuable stuff, like, like, okay, not, not like monetarily valuable, but like intrinsically, you know, there's a certain value to having a certain value to using it. Otherwise it would just be like, say it's prayers and do it. You're, you're good to go, you know, but so it seems like, you know, finding a way to, you know, make that more available to people who are in situations where they don't have that access. Like I've, I was looking online. I was curious about this and there was one family, the Kukierski family. I totally butchered their name. I'm sure. But they seem like they're centered around Steubenville, Ohio, which most of the North American Catholic world is kind of has Steubenville as its access point. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, and they, they have exercise salt that you can buy, but it's not like you're buying the salt, you're buying the container that it comes in. And I think you can even buy the containers empty for the same price or something along those lines. And it seems like that's a little more on the up and up with it. But, uh, yeah. Do you guys know of any, any way, like, is there some group of fathers that are just like, Hey, if you send us a letter, we'll send you X, Y, and Z. Yeah. I haven't really, I haven't really heard of that before. Um, like I think like Marytown in, Mm -hmm. um, in Illinois, like it's a kind of the same situation. Like you're buying, like the container essentially, or you're giving it by donation or something like that. It's not like you're, you know, it's not simony or whatever. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't really know. Like one of, one of the things that I would say is, um, and this is, this might be a weird pro tip, but like, if you can find a younger Catholic priest and say, Hey, I want, I want to get some blessed salt, but I want it blessed in the old right. Younger priests are generally far more open to the idea of doing it for you. Um, I don't, if you have the prayers and stuff like available so yeah. that it would be like 
super, super easy. <laughs> yeah. Like you just show up with a box of salt and, and whatnot. Yeah. And, and, you know, the book with the page book marked for him. Yeah. would be ideal. The other thing I, I was just thinking is if there's no Latin mass near you or no community where you can go regularly, if you're making a, like a once or twice a year trip, maybe that's uh a strategy to when you plan to go, the best days might be something like Candlemas or Epiphany mm -hmm. or the days when you can, you know, bring in your gallons of water to uh, become holy water or bring in your box of candles for the year or something like that, right? Yeah, make, make a road trip of it, you know, just load up the car with a ton of water and some salt and just just drive away and see what people think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. I mean, I know priests, especially, you know, priests in like the FSSP and whatnot, um, SSPX too, I think are fairly generous and fairly like understanding of people's unique situations. Right. Um, so if you were to email them and say, yo, like I'm coming up in a month, um, can I bring some holy water and some salt and, or bring some water and some salt and have you bless it? You know, um, according to the old, right. I'm sure they'd, they'd be open to that, you know, but that does take kind of, this is a thing. This is a thing. They're probably going to make an effort to put in their calendar. Yeah. Someone specifically reaching out for something important like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm something that my mom introduced me to, which I hadn't really heard of, um, was particularly with St. Benedict medals. St. Benedict medals are generally used for, you know, exorcisms and things like that. Um, there's actually, if you're not aware of it, but there's actually, um, like letters on there that are like essentially, um, what's, I'm not sure what the words what the words are, but it's, you know, basically commanding Body, Satan. retro Satana. Yeah. yeah like tell, yeah. Telling Satan <laughs> to get lost. Um, so yeah. turn back uh, and drink your poison yourself. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually quite awesome. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, she, she had heard of a tradition where you put, um, the St. Benedict medals at, f you bury them, at the four corners of the house. Um, like mm -hmm. of the property. Um, Neat. as a mean, a means of defense. So, um, so she introduced me to that. Um, I've, so I've come to find out that the St. Benedict medal, if you have a tattoo of the St. Benedict medal, doesn't carry the same power. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like somebody has a secret, uh, tattoo that they're not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? I was very, very passionate, not quite as smart as I should have been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 You, you start experiencing well, we spiritual warfare and, and Satan shows up and goes, Hey, nice tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> Sick dude. <laughs> he shows, he shows his. I yeah. Find, you know. <laughs> uh, we knew, we knew a guy that had St. Benedict metal tattooed on his back oh yeah Who? i don't want to say the oh, name oh, okay because i can't <laughs> pronounce it and i don't remember <laughs> <laughs> i just know it was really big he i think he went on to be a priest possibly i think i only met them like twice so but he was just like yeah hmm. <laughs> yep um something something else i i think uh and this is kind of a bit kind of a different direction, but um, I was kind of thinking about like potential Trojan horses that, mm -hmm. you know, on the surface can seem innocent, but um, you don't really realize kind of what you're bringing into the home when you have it. And so like, you know, things like obviously screens, right? You want to be incredibly prudent with the use of screens in your family, watching things with, shows with bad morals or things like blasphemy, you know, even just hearing blasphemy can have spiritual impacts. So, um, 
if you can cut that out of your home, do it. But also I think we ourselves can be Trojan horses. If mm-hmm. we're living in a state of, of sin, unrepentant sin, you know, if we're not living the sacramental life, we're not living a life of regular mental prayer uh, and, and virtue. Um, if we're just living in a state of unrest, anxiety, like useless anxiety, you know, a sense of, you know, just no peace that can have real impacts on the lives of ourselves, our spouses and our children. Um, and so we have to be really, really vigilant with that stuff too, because yeah, the more that we kind of give into that stuff, the more we open the door to, to the enemy taking, you know, a toehold, a foothold, a stronghold, you know? Yep. <laughs> everyone's just everyone's just nodding yeah yeah no i mean 100 percent. i mean you've got to definitely be in charge especially with children you've got to be in oh, charge yeah. of what they put into their brains because once it's in there once it's in there it's not coming out yeah, yeah. which this is one of the like okay so a couple of a couple of shows ago i went off on a rant on social media and cell phones. <laughs> this is one of the things that I, I'm going to be the anti-technology. I'm such a Mennonite still. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but you still have a blender, Tim. You still have a blender. I, uh, I do have a blender. It's fantastic. It's <laughs> the, one of the little ninja blenders. I love that. Thing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's okay. So like these uh, headsets that they have, the, the virtual reality. Yeah, they're really cool. You know, my kid, he wants one bad you know he wants to play minecraft in 3d but that sounds so fun <laughs> yeah it does and like i'm there 100 percent with him except for i'm not going to have a screen in my house that i can't see yeah um, agreed yeah i mean i have nothing against video games as a concept you know they're obviously exist they obviously exist on a spectrum i mean you've got minecraft and these little builder games over here and you've got you know assassin's creed and whatever on the opposite end and you know one's obviously much more morally defensible than the other but Mm -hmm. you know i can't give my son a screen where i can't look at it and be like okay this is exactly what's going on right now because Mm -hmm. ultimately catholic home defense you know we're answerable for what happens under our roof yeah yeah someday we're gonna have to stand before god and be like yeah i didn't have the software on my computer and that is why my son found pornography at age whatever this i didn't you know i didn't take charge where i should have i don't want (laughs) to not want to be in that position i've got enough to answer for already yeah i remember finding like it was either a cd or a dvd back from my high school days or something like that and i remember finding i was like i don't want like i think I think I think I was pregnant and we were moving or something and I was going through stuff to see what I had. It's like I don't want my future children to listen to this or watch it or whatever. There's something sketchy on it. I can't remember what. But I just broke it and I threw it in the garbage. And I was like, problem solved. I don't even have to worry about donating it and it being somebody else's problem. Just toss it. Yeah. Yeah, that's some that's something that like Julie and I kind of had a conversation about you know, a little over a year ago, we were looking through our DVD collection and we're like, there's some, there's some stuff here. That like, like, obviously we haven't watched a lot of stuff for a long time. They just kind of got packed up and moved. And we're looking at the DVD collection. We're like, there's some serious junk in here. Like, like mm-hmm. all of these have a blasphemy in them. Like all of these have, and we're like, and, and Julie's like, well, what are we going to do? Like, should we sell them on marketplace? And I was like, no, we can't just like, essentially hand off a loaded grenade to somebody else, you know, Mm -hmm. like this is not, you know, at a, at a justice, we can't do that, you know, and then, and then benefit monetarily from it. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so giving it away to the Salvation Army is, is still not a good option. It's not real charity, you know, Mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's probably a radical opinion, on, but on the flip yeah. side though, on the flip side, there are so many movies out there. Like Hollywood went through this era in like the forties and fifties where they were making fantastic movies. I mean, mm-hmm. you had Ben Hur being, being made, uh, the robe, I mean, just 
movie after movie. And I found dozens of these movies where it's like, wow, I've never seen this. And I go through and watch, and these movies are amazing. And they're all oh, yeah. you know, like dead on for the faith. You know, like just mm-hmm. like nothing that is controversial, nothing that is offensive, you know, but they're high quality movies. They tell good stories. You know, they, you know, they're not like the problem with Christian movies today is they're always pushing the message uh, with at the expense of the story with these though. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's actual art as opposed mm-hmm. to just this product that they're wrapping up and shipping out. And yeah. so, I mean, it's, it's not the Kirk, Kirk Cameron version of Christian <laughs> films. Man, but I love mm-hmm. Kirk Cameron. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, if I left everyone uh, behind, grand- is that no? Okay. No, yeah. My uh, <laughs> my grandparents really love Kirk Cameron, and God, bless them. <laughs> they're so they're so sweet. Uh, yeah. I moved into I moved in my house a few years ago, and I got a phone call about three days after we'd moved in. Hey, we're going to be coming out to out east. Just to let you know, we're gonna be staying with you for two weeks. So they showed up five days after I moved into my house oh my and stayed God. for two weeks. <laughs> but again, I love them. They're so sweet. It's so like <laughs> I'm socially awkward. They're 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 just socially awkward to the nth degree because <laughs> like they spent most of their lives, you know, translating the Bible down in um, down in Mexico for the Aztecs. Uh, like wow, smart people. But very, very insulated. Love Kirk Cameron. Yeah. They showed us <laughs> one night when we were having a movie night, they showed us a Kirk Cameron documentary. And my wife and I were just like, okay, we're just we're gonna, we're just gonna sit here and we're just gonna kinda make it through. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you like it? Oh, it was great. They go to bed. My wife looks at me, what was that that we just watched? Yeah. It was about the pilgrims and I uh, it was the weirdest thing, but yeah, Kirk Cameron, man. Oh. Yep. God bless. Can we him. talk about movies on a on a further on a future episode? Because yeah. oh, absolutely. Like movies, movies then versus movies now would be amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah, I I I've got a lot I want to get into. There's just fantastic movies from from the day. Like when I converted, my biggest picture of Catholicism was I hate to say it, uh, Bells of Saint Mary. Mm. <laughs> So, you know, I came in, I was expecting, you know, Ingrid Bergman uh, <laughs> as a nine. <laughs> that was not, that was not the church that I found, but <laughs> sadly, sadly. Yeah, no, it, it, sadly. It's, it's so great yeah. how it's so great, but also so terrifying how these movies, how this media can form our mental image of what life should be. And we can actually you know, see that, you know, like, oh, you know, we're making the world around us like these movies and we're making these movies like the world around us. And it's this cyclic thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Let's Mm -hmm. absolutely have a, have a discussion about it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And going back to like, uh, like the home defense and treating your home like a domestic church. Mm -hmm. So if you think, if you think about the things you would, you know, allow on a screen, right or coming out of your mouth or how you would speak to somebody really put it into the context of um, your home as that domestic church. And it should be a holy place. Right. In some, in some sense, like it's not just my house, it's God's house. That kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah. Like my, my parents would always say, you got to behave in God's house. Mm-hmm. When going to church, right? And it's good advice. Like that's a good way to explain it to kids. But yeah. yeah. In some sense, our house is also like it all belongs to God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and not to get a little Carmelite, but I'm gonna get a little Carmelite. The Oh, here he goes. And yeah, here we go. Here we go. Um <laughs> like just like in the church, right? There's a tabernacle. Um, in our homes, our souls are the tabernacle. And so Mm -hmm. it is so necessary for us to treat our Lord. Uh, uh Oh, Oh, no. I brought props. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You did. I mean, I mean, it's an Oak prop. It's not OCD, but 
you know, yeah. eh, what, what it's what I could get a hold of. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, he just showed a, a Ocarm shirt. Uh, I don't know how we're going to incorporate this into an audio podcast, but that's amazing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, like we need to ensure that we always are keeping our souls in that state of grace. Um, because mm-hmm. as soon as we're in mortal sin, we we kick our Lord out. You know, so it's it's so necessary for us to to remain, um, yeah, and to keep our Lord present there, um, and and to regularly turn there, turn inwardly in there, and and recognize that our Lord dwells inwardly in our in our souls, but also in the souls of our children, in the souls of our spouse. You know, like yeah. So, um. Because if we had that kind of mentality, if we essentially saw our, our family members as tabernacles, would we say the things, you know, or monstrances? If we, you know, if we really saw them as that, would we really say the things we do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And room. Um. All right, you guys. Well, that's it. Hey, can I um, can I plant a seed for a future episode as we're wrapping up? Yeah, let's do it. So. I know Brooke and I, and also I mentioned this in the chat, we're thinking about the servile state for a future episode, the Hilaire Belloc book. I wanted to plant a seed and see if you guys think the same thing as me, if you're going to read it between now and the next episode. There is, he kind of discusses certain characters in a society um and their traits and whatnot so you'll have to keep an eye out for the kind of caricature character that is doug ford because he's in there there's a character that's i won't say which one yet because i'm saving it for the podcast but uh our illustrious premier of ontario is uh just described to a t and uh, it's amazing. <laughs> Can't wait to get into it. That's sweet. I got to tell you, Mike, you are a champion. You know, you've been doing the dad thing for all this time. And yeah, you're just a true champion, Doug Ford. So <laughs> <laughs> always calling I'm everybody Google champions. Doug Ford. I'm a numbers guy. I always go back to the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, five. <sighs> I'm a numbers guy. Let's let's see these fifty thousand truckers show up. <laughs> let's see him count those. Uh, anyway, it's a good number. Yeah. All right, you guys. Well, thank you for another wonderful episode. Um, again, and to all of our friends who are listening, thank you for listening to today's podcast. Let us know your thoughts. Hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You know, you can find us at Theology of the Buddy and stay tratty on Twitter. Um, you can also send us a voicemail via Facebook Messenger or Instagram if you'd like. Uh, just hit that uh, voice message thing and we can take that and put your comments on the podcast. So we'd really appreciate it if you'd do that um, as well. Please, we'd love for you to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, YouTube, TuneIn, um, or wherever, wherever you listen to great podcasts. Um, so yeah so we're going to be back in two weeks from today talking about the servile state is that what our plans are sounds good to me okay so we're going to be talking about Hilaire Belloc and the servile state um, which is going to be led by Mike so thank you very much in advance Mike for leading the podcast <laughs> so everybody make sure you're you're subscribed so you know when that comes out um, and uh a blessed candle miss to all of you. And until next time, stay, stay tratty. Tratty.